This evening, we are going to study the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And let me just say that it's going to be very, very frustrating for me tonight because this is a topic which merits far more than just one presentation. There are many technical matters, many issues that must be dealt with which we will not be able to deal with because we won't have the time. However, I have good news for you. And that is that all of those technical matters are addressed in a document that I wrote, 30 some pages, uh, called Notes on Daniel 9. And you can download that information at our ministry website, secretsunsealed.org. And so if you're interested in something more than what we're going to do tonight, if you want to uh, deal with some of the technical matters and uh, receive much more information, I invite you to go to our website and uh, you're free to download uh, anything on our website. We just put the Daniel 7 material there, we have the material on the rapture, and now we also have the 70 weeks there. Now, this prophecy of the 70 weeks is the greatest messianic prophecy of the Old Testament. And the reason why it's the greatest prophecy about the Messiah is because it not only describes the events of the Messiah's life, but it describes the exact timing in which those events were fulfilled in history. In other words, it's precise as to event and as to time in the life of the Messiah. Now, in order for us to understand the prophecy of the 70 weeks, we need to gain some historical context. And so I want us to go in our minds back to the year 605 BC. Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and he besieged Jerusalem and actually took Daniel and his three friends captive to Babylon. I want to read those verses in Daniel chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. It says there, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now this is happening in 605 BC. And what we need to understand from this passage is that Jerusalem was not destroyed at this point. The temple was not destroyed. What happened is that Jerusalem lost the right to self-governance. In other words, it became subject to Nebuchadnezzar. It no longer had independence in its own governance. In other words, it lost its right of governance. But the city was not at this point destroyed yet. Now, a little later on, in the year 586 BC, the city and the temple were actually destroyed. That is described in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verses 15 through 20. Let's go there, 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verses 15 through 20. It's a large passage, but I think that it's important that we read it so we gain the context within which we are going to talk of the 70 weeks. It says there, and the Lord God of their fathers, that is of Israel, sent to them by his messengers, raising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and he misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man, or on him who stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all 
these he brought to Babylon. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now threescore and ten years are seventy years. In other words, from the time in which Jerusalem lost her governance in the year 605 until the captivity ended, there were going to be 70 years. Now it's not between the time when Jerusalem was destroyed and when they returned from the captivity. It's from the time in which they lost self-governance until the captivity ended. In other words, this period begins in 605 BC and ends in 536 when Cyrus gives the decree for God's people to leave Babylon and to go back to their land. What I want us to notice for now, which is very, very important, is that Israel lost its right to govern itself before the city was actually destroyed. Which means that if Israel was going to be restored later on, two things would have to be restored. Number Number one, self-governance, the right to rule themselves, and in the second place, they would have to rebuild the wall and the sanctuary and the city. For now, I want us to remember that there are two steps. They had to recover self-governance, the right to rule themselves, and they had also to build the wall and the city and the temple. Now I'd like to go to Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, just for a moment, because we have to also include this in our study of Daniel chapter 9, where we find the 70 weeks. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, we have a verse which is extremely important to the Seventh-day Adventist church. It says there, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Other versions say, then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful state. Then shall the sanctuary be vindicated. In other words, according to this passage, 2,300 days, and applying the year-day principle, 2,300 years were going to pass before the sanctuary would be cleansed or restored. Now Daniel was confused. Because God had said that the captivity was going to last how long? 70 years. But suddenly now, God apparently is throwing him a curve. God is saying, it's going to be 2,300 years until the sanctuary is cleansed or restored. Daniel was confused. He couldn't understand. And so we find that Daniel, in chapter 9, this is several years later, by the way, in chapter 8, he got sick. You can read the end of the chapter. God was not able even to explain the 2,300 years because he got ill, he got sick. Imagine he was expecting the, their religion to be reestablished se in 70 years, and now God says that it's going to take 2,300 years. So he couldn't stand it. He got ill, and God was not able to finish the explanation. Several years later, Daniel remembers the 2,300 years. And he says, oh, no, that's right. We're nearing the year 536, but... I remember now that God said that the captivity is going to last, the sanctuary is going to be trampled underfoot for 2,300 years. And he thinks to himself, maybe it's because Israel is so sinful that God has decided to extend the 70 years to 2,300 years. And so now Daniel prays to God. And we'll notice the climax of that prayer in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 19. He confesses the sinfulness of Israel. He confesses his own sinfulness. He, he's praying to God, pouring out his heart to God for his city and for his people and for the sanctuary because he wants all of these to be restored at the end of the 70 years. And when in verse 19 he reaches the climax of his prayer, he says this, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 19. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. And now notice, defer not 
What does the word defer mean? Really, in the Hebrew language, it means delay not, postpone not. What is Daniel praying for God not to do? Don't postpone the promise that you have made. So he says here in verse 19, defer not for thine own sake, O God, because you were the one who promised there was going to be 70 years. For the city and thy people are called by thy name. Don't delay the fulfillment. Don't delay it 2,300 years and then restore our religion. Fulfill the promise that you have made. And of course, God sends Gabriel to Daniel in answer to his prayer and gives to Daniel this prophecy of the 70 weeks. Let's notice Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, actually verse 24. It says here, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Question, who, which was Daniel's holy city? Jerusalem. Who was Daniel's people? The Jewish nation, right? And so it says here that 70 weeks were determined for whom? For Daniel's city and for Daniel's people. By the way, the word determined can also be translated cut off. Now why is that important? Because really the 70 weeks are cut off from the larger prophecy of the 2300 days. The 70 weeks are the first part of the 2300 years or the 2300 days. In other words, of those 2300 years, the first 70 weeks, and how much is 70 weeks? How many years? 70 weeks times 7 days each week is equal to 490. 490 years, the first 490 years applied to whom? Applied to the city and to the people of Daniel. Is this clear? Very, very important. Now, the key question is, when do the 70 weeks begin? If they're cut off from the 2300 days or the 2300 years, we need to know when to begin the 70 weeks. Well, the Bible gives us an indication about when the 70 weeks begin. Notice verse 25. It says here, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, other versions say decree, from the going forth of the commandment or the decree, to what? To restore and to what? And to build Jerusalem. Now, as Adventists, sometimes we read something and we don't pay very close attention to what it's saying. Restore and build are not the same thing. To restore means to return to Israel its right of self-rule according to its laws. Whereas to build means reestablishing, reconstructing the city itself. Are you understanding what I'm saying? What were the two problems? The two problems were, in 605, Israel lost her right to what? To rule herself by her laws. A few years later, what happened to the city? It was destroyed. And so now, those two problems have to be resolved. Jerusalem has to be restored. In other words, Jerusalem has to recover its right to its own rule to self-governance. And secondly, Jerusalem needs to be what? Needs to be rebuilt. Now the question is, which decree gave Israel the right to both of these things? Number one, to rule themselves, and number two, to rebuild the city and the walls of the city. Well, there are four possible decrees. One of them was given by Cyrus in the year 536. And by the way, if you want 
an abundance of information on these decrees and why the decree that I'm going to mention is the correct decree, you need to go to our website and you need to take a look at that material, Notes on Daniel 9. There it's all spelled out with an abundance of historical and biblical evidence, things that we can't go into right now. The people who are going to get this presentation on DVD, they'll know that they'll be able to access this at the website. Most of your questions will be answered. Now the first decree was given by Cyrus in the year 536. That's when he gave the decree for God's people to go back to their land. But according to that decree, they were only given permission to do what? To rebuild the temple. And the decree says to restore and build what? Jerusalem. And so that one doesn't apply. Now in the year 520, 16 years later, Israel had, had gone back but they quit building the temple. They never actually finished the temple. They put in the foundations. So a second Persian king by the name of Darius I gave another decree telling the people to get down to business and to build the temple. This was not really a new decree. It was a confirmation of the decree given by Cyrus. In other words, basically, it's the same decree repeated again. Cyrus is saying, you folks need to go back to Jerusalem. You need to rebuild the temple. I've already given, uh, one of the kings of Persia has already given a decree for you to do this. So get down to business. But these two decrees had only to do with the rebuilding of the temple. There was a third decree. It was given by Artaxerxes in the year 457 B.C. This is the decree which gives the beginning of the 70 weeks. If you read Ezra 7, this is where this decree is found. You'll discover that Artaxerxes not only gave the Israelites a right to return to their land to rebuild the city, but he also gave them the right to establish judges and magistrates and rulers to carry on the civil affairs of Israel. He even gave them authorization to execute the death penalty if it was necessary. So this decree by Artaxerxes is the only one that fits the prescription to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now there's another decree given by Artaxerxes in 444 B.C. And remember B.C. we're going down. In 444 B.C., Nehemiah went into Artaxerxes and asked him for permission to go back to the city of Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And so the king gave him permission. The king didn't actually even give a decree. This was really a confirmatory degree, decree of the first degree, a decree that Artaxerxes gave in the year 457. So what I'm saying is, of these four possible decrees, only one of them fits the description of the beginning of the 70 weeks. And that is the one given by Artaxerxes in the year 457 BC. Now somebody might say, how do you know it was the year 457? Because in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 7, it tells us that this, this decree was given in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. We know that Artaxerxes, this is one of the most firmly established dates in ancient history. We know that he began to rule in the year 464 B.C. So if you go forward to his seventh year, you'll go to the year 457 B.C. And by the way, there was a book written by two Seventh-day Adventist scholars, Siegfried Horn and Kenneth Wood. The name of the book is The Chronology of Ezra 7. These men did an intensive study of the archaeological, historical, and astronomical records from this period of time. And they came to the conclusion, without any shadow of doubt, scholars agree on this, that this decree was given in the fall of the year 457 B.C. In other words, the prophecy of the 70 weeks begins in the year 457 B.C. That's when the command is given to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, let's notice in Daniel chapter 9 some additional details. Once again, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, now notice this, unto Messiah the Prince, that is to say, from the time the decree is given until Messiah the Prince comes, there will be how long? There shall be 
seven weeks and three score and two weeks. How much are seven weeks? Seven times seven, 49. How much are 62 weeks? 62 times seven, 434. So what do you do? You add 49, which are the seven weeks, plus 434, which are the 62 weeks, and what is the total? 483 days, or what? Years, because these are weeks of years. Are you with me? So you have seven weeks plus 62 weeks lead you from the decree to the coming of Messiah the Prince. Now the question is why is this period of 69 weeks divided into two parts? Why doesn't it just simply say 69 weeks? Why does it say seven weeks and 62 weeks? The reason is very simple. The first seven weeks of this period had to do with the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. It had to do with the rebuilding not only of the city but also of the wall. In other words, the first 49 years had to do with building and restoring the city of Jerusalem. And that's the reason why it's divided into two. You have the seven weeks, 49 years. During that period, Jerusalem be, is being restored and rebuilt. And then 62 weeks later, 434 years later, you have Messiah the Prince arriving or coming. Now there's a detail I want to share with you, and there's no way that I can read the verses or get into it, but you will be able to see it on the document that I wrote. You'll notice that in, in uh, verse uh, 25, it says, it continues saying, there shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Street of what? Street of where? What's going to be rebuilt? Which street? What city? Jerusalem. Which wall? Jerusalem. Now I know this is going to sound really strange, but it's biblical. The translation street and wall is really a mistranslation. The word street really should be translated square. It's talking about the town square. By the way, that's the reason why the New Jerusalem, it says, it doesn't say that it has streets of gold, it says it has street of gold. Really, it has a square of gold where the throne of God is. And I have several examples from the Bible, text from the Bible, to show that the best translation is square. The square of the city is built. In a moment, I'm going to tell you why. And the translation wall, this is the only place where this Hebrew word is translated wall. In other places, it's not translated wall, it's translated decision making. You say, how in the world can you get this, this so different from, from what the other texts say it is? Well, you have to read the document because I can't go into it. We don't have enough time. But I guarantee you that there's a full explanation in the document that I wrote about this. So really what it's saying here is that uh, what will be established is the square of the city and decision making. Now why is that important? What does decision making imply? It means that they have the right to what? To govern themselves. And do you know what's interesting? In ancient cities, where were civil, military, economic, and religious decisions made? They were made in the city square. In other words, this is a description of what it means to restore and to build Jerusalem. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So basically, what we find here is that during the first 49 years, Israel was going to have its decision-making power to rule, restored, and the place where those decisions were made, the city square. Are you following me or not? You say, well, pastor, you know, that's wild. I've never heard that before. Well, maybe you've never studied it before. <laughs> You know, we dealt with this in prayer meeting extensively. We were in the book of Daniel for three years. We have it all on tape. We have 79 tapes on the book of Daniel. So if you, if you want something to do in your spare time, I encourage you to get those. It's with a fine-tooth comb. 
We need to understand these things in the times in which we're living. We need to be able to give a reason for our faith. Amen? Amen. Now, we have then, from the time that the decree is given until the coming of the Messiah, how many weeks? 69 weeks. 69 times 7 is what? 483 years. But they're supposed to be how many? 490. Now, if you go from the year 457 BC, 483 years forward, what date does it take you to? It takes you to the year 27 AD. And I know somebody's going to do the operation. And they're going to say, no, it doesn't. It doesn't actually give you 483, it gives you 484. Oh, oh, we're in trouble now. No, we're not. Because you see, there's no year zero. There's only one year between 1 BC and 1 AD. Are you following me? And so you have to subtract one year. And so really you have 483 years because there is no zero year. Now what was going to happen at the end of the 69 weeks? Messiah, the prince, was going to what? was going to come. Now do you know what the word Messiah means? The word Messiah means anointed. In other words, after 69 weeks, the anointed one would come. By the way, the word Messiah in Hebrew is the same word Christ in Greek. Go with me to John chapter 1 and verse 41. You'll see that. John chapter 1 and verse 41. It says there, He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the what? The Christ. By the way, that's where we get our word christened. What is a christening? It's an anointing with oil, isn't it? A christening? Christening comes from Christ. It's really Christening. So, in other words, 483 years were going to transpire between when the decree was given until the anointed one would come. The question is, who was anointed and how was he anointed? Let's pursue several avenues here. Luke chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. This is where things really get amazing. It's speaking about an event immediately after the baptism of Christ. And notice all of the chronological details that are given. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Eteria, of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Do you think there are enough historical references here? The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now the key chronological de detail is that this is taking place in the 15th year of whom? Of Tiberius Caesar. Now we know that Tiberius Caesar began to rule in the year 12 AD. We know that. That's a historical fact. He began to rule in 12 AD. So what do you do? To 12 you add what? 15 years because it's his 15th year and so that takes you to what year? 12 plus 15 is what? 27. It takes you to 27 AD as the date for the anointing of Messiah. Now the question is, when was Jesus anointed? Let's notice several passages very quickly. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. This is immediately after the baptism of Christ. And notice what Jesus says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has what? Anointed me. When was He anointed? What came upon Jesus when He was baptized? The Holy Spirit. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. 
Notice Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Same idea coming through. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And now what I want you to notice is that immediately after his baptism, Jesus makes a very interesting declaration. Notice Mark chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. This is immediately after what we just read. The Holy Spirit has fallen upon Jesus. And notice what he says. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. Which time is fulfilled? Which is the only time prophecy that points to the fulfillment of the anointing of the Messiah? Daniel 9. And so immediately after his baptism, when the Holy Spirit falls on him, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So after his baptism, Jesus says, the time in the prophecy of the 70 weeks has been what? Fulfilled. Notice also John chapter 1 and verse 32. John chapter 1 and verse 32. It says here, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. It's talking about his baptism and the falling of the Holy Spirit upon him. Now notice verse 41. Immediately after the baptism of Jesus, notice what uh, Simon's brother has to say. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found whom? The Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So immediately after his baptism, Jesus is introduced to Simon as whom? As the Messiah, because he has been what? Anointed. Notice also Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. The Bible is very clear on this point. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. It says there, how God anointed. That's the word Messiah. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. That happened at his baptism, right? That he was anointed. Who went about doing good and healing all were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So we have an abundance of avenues to pursue to determine when Jesus was anointed. He was anointed at the moment of his baptism. In other words, that was his anointing. Now, the question is, what season of the year was Jesus baptized? You say, well, how can we know that? It's very simple. What season of the year was Jesus crucified? He was crucified at Passover, right? And this prophecy says that he was cut off when? In the middle of the last week. Which would be how many years? If it's the middle of the last seven years. Three and a half years. So if he dies in the middle of the week at Passover, which is in the spring, you would have to go back how long? three and a half years and you would know when he was baptized. Now what happens if you go from the spring backwards three and a half years? Well you go from the spring of the year 27 actually from the spring of the year 31 to the spring of the year 30 to the spring of the year 29 to the spring of the year 28 to the fall of the year 27. Are you following me? In other words, Jesus was baptized in the fall. So far, so good? Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. Very good. Some of you didn't raise your hand. I hope it's because you're tired. Now, let's go back to Daniel chapter 9 and study the events that take place during the last week because we've only talked about the moment when Messiah is anointed at the moment of his baptism. Now let's notice Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. It says, and after three score and two weeks, how many weeks is that? After 62 weeks, 
plus how many at the beginning? Plus the seven weeks at the beginning, which is how many weeks? 69 weeks. After three score and two weeks, shall what? Shall Messiah, the anointed one, be what? Be cut off. What was going to happen to the Messiah sometime after the 69 weeks when he had already been anointed? He was going to be cut off. Now what does that mean, cut off? Well, let's finish the verse. Uh, actually, the, the first part of the verse. It says, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Go with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. This wonderful messianic prophecy. Verse 5. It says about Jesus, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Was he, was, did he do it for himself? No. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Was he cut off for himself? No, he was cut off for us. Now notice verse 8 of Isaiah 53. The very expression is used in this Messianic prophecy. It says there, speaking about Jesus, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare His generation? For He was what? He was cut off from the land of the living. Which means that He what? He died. What was going to happen according to the prophecy of the 70 weeks in this last week? Messiah was going to be cut off, not for himself. In other words, he was going to what? He was going to die, not for himself, because he was dying for whom? Because he was dying for us. In other words, this is a prophecy about the death of the Messiah. But now I want you to notice another interesting detail at the end of verse 26. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And now notice, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So what is going to be destroyed after Messiah is cut off? What's going to be destroyed? The city and what else? The sanctuary. Question, which city? Which sanctuary? The temple where? In Jerusalem. Let me ask you then. Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Was Jerusalem going to be destroyed again? Yes. According to this prophecy, yes. Was this destruction linked with what the Messiah did? Yes. Because it says that Messiah would be cut off, not for himself, and then it talks about what? About the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Did the destruction and Jer of Jerusalem and the temple have anything to do with the death of the Messiah? Yes, the text make it, makes it absolutely clear. Both of these things are linked together. Now notice verse 27. And he, who's the he there? The, the he is the prince that shall come, right? Who is this prince that shall come? Most Adventists believe it was Titus. We're going to discuss that in a few moments. He refers to the Messiah, to the prince, Messiah the prince. And so it says, he shall what? Confirm the covenant with many for how long? For one week. Which week? Tell me, which week? One of the first 69? Or the last one? The last one, obviously, because it's discussing events in the last week. Now what is this? What does this mean? He will confirm the covenant with many. Go with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verses 27 and 28. Matthew 26 and verses 27 and 28. This is where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And notice what he says. And he took the cup and gave thanks. And gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new... It says New Testament in the King James, but it's the identical Greek word covenant. Diatheke is the Greek word. In other words, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Do you notice the two key words? Covenant and many? 
He shall confirm the covenant with many during the last week. Notice also Mark 10 verse 45, the very same word many applied to Jesus. It says there in Mark 10 verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. There it is again, the word many. Notice Isaiah 53 and verse 11. Once again, the same key word, Isaiah 53 and verse 11. It says, He shall see of the travail of his soul, that's speaking about the Messiah, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their what? Their iniquities, of course, by his death. So who is it that confirms the covenant with many for the last week? It is actually the Messiah according to the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 as well as the text that we find in the Gospels. But do you know how futurists interpret this? They say that this covenant is made by, a, by the future Antichrist. They say the prince who will come, will come after the church has been raptured to heaven. And he's going to be this nasty little horn, this nasty beast, who's going to arise over in the Middle East. And he's going to make a secular political covenant with the Jews. And then in the middle of the week, he's going to break that covenant with the Jews. And he's going to start persecuting them. And then you're going to have the tribulation for the Jews. But do you know what's interesting? The, the word covenant in the book of Daniel... Every single time it's used, and you can document this in the, in the material that I mentioned, it's on our webpage. Every single time that the word covenant is used in the book of, da book of Daniel, it refers to God's covenant. Never does it refer to a secular political covenant. So to interject there, that, into the text is simply impossible. Now, let's go once again to Daniel chapter 9, and uh, let's continue reading verse 27. Daniel 9, verse 27. It says here, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, in the middle of the week, which week? Uh, week number 55? Week number 63? No, which week? Week number 70. And in the what? In the midst of the week or in the middle of the week, he, who is the he there? It's the same Messiah the Prince. Do you notice that it says, until the coming of Messiah the Prince, then it speaks about Messiah, then it speaks about the Prince, then it speaks about him. It's the same person all the way through. Now, notice it says, and he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to what? To cease. to cease. In the middle of the week. Do you know what the word oblation means? It means offering. He will cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. Let me ask you, what happened when Jesus died on the cross with the veil of the temple? Notice Mark chapter 15 and verse 38. Mark chapter 15 verse 38. It says here, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to what? From top to bottom. What was God saying when he rent that veil from top to bottom? He was saying that the sacrificial service of the sanctuary was what? Finished. It had no meaning because the true lamb had been sacrificed for sin. He caused the sacrifice and the oblation to what? To cease. It's not some antichrist who will sit in the Jewish temple and forbid the Jews from sacrificing animals. This is a messianic prophecy. It's not about antichrist. It's about Christ. It's a wonderful vindication of the inspiration of the Holy Bible. Who could have predicted with such precision every single event of the life of the Messiah hundreds of years before it happened? Unless God knows the end from the beginning. Notice also Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. Speaking about Jesus, it says, Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did what? Once when he offered up himself. 
In other words, no more sacrifices. He caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now let's go back to Daniel 9 because there's a very interesting expression here that we need to take a look at. Daniel chapter 9 and let's go back to verse 27. It says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and now notice, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. What is he going to make desolate? The city and the people, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Once again I ask you the question, does the destiny of Jerusalem have anything to do with what the Messiah does? Twice! Once in verse 26, it says he's cut off in the middle of the week, not for himself, then it speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Here we are told that he causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and then what does it speak about? The destruction of Jerusalem. Is the death of the Messiah given as the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem. Twice in Daniel 9 these two ideas are linked together. Now let's go back for a moment to verse 26 and notice another interesting detail. It says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come. Who is the prince? Jesus. Who is the people of the prince? Who are the people of the prince? The, the Jewish nation. And so it says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall what? Shall destroy the city and the what? And the sanctuary. Now we have a problem. Who destroys the city and the sanctuary? It says the people of the prince. Did the Jews destroy Jerusalem? Oh no? By the way, let me interject this. Do you know that every time in the book of Daniel that the word prince is used outside of the historical sections like the prince of the eunuchs and so on, but every time that it's used in the prophetic sections of the book of Daniel, the word prince always refers to a supernatural divine person. For example, Messiah the prince, Daniel 9.25, the prince of the host, Daniel 8.11 and 12, the prince of the covenant, Daniel 11 verse 22, and Michael the great prince, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Now who is this prince who is to come? Let's go to Psalm 118. Psalm 118 and verse 22. Notice, the stone which the builders refused or rejected is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. Is this a messianic prophecy? Is this a prophecy about the Messiah? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Absolutely. And now notice, a few verses further down in verse 26, that was verse 22, in verse 26 it says, notice, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Who is he that cometh in the name of the Lord? He's the stone that the what? That the builders rejected. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. We really have to motor here. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. There's so much to cover here. There's so much detail. We could dedicate so much more time. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Does Jesus apply this prophecy of Psalm 118 to himself? Yes. He most certainly does. But there's something else about Jesus. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem, I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 19. Some very interesting words were sung by the multitude. It says in Luke 19, verse 37 to verse 44, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, notice, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Was this the Prince who was coming? 
Yes, he was. Was he the stone that the builders rejected? Was this going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes, let's continue reading. It says, saying, Blessed be the king who cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees among, among, among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee. Is he talking about the consequences of them rejecting him? Yes. Does the destruction of the city have anything to do with the rejection of Christ? The crucifixion of Christ in this passage? Yes. Is he the one who comes in the name of the Lord? Is he the rock that the builders rejected? Yes. He is the prince who is to what? Who is to come. It continues saying, For the day shall come upon thee, and that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave thee in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy what? The time of thy visitation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, He's cut off, not for himself, but for others. And the consequence is the city is what? Destroyed. He causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He is the prince who is to come, but he's rejected. And he speaks about the destruction of what? He speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem. So in other words, twice the work of the Messiah is linked with the destruction of the city. Let's read once again verse 26 and verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And now notice the terminology. And for the overspreading of abominations, don't forget that word abominations, he shall make it desolate. Make what desolate? the city and the sanctuary, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the what? The desolate. Two key words. Abomination, abominations and what? And desolate. Remember those words. We're going to come back to them in a moment. I come back to the question, how is it that the people of the prince destroyed the city? It wasn't the it was Titus that destroyed the city, wasn't it? Or was it God who destroyed the city? Or was it the Jews who destroyed the city? The fact is that all three did. But the ones who precipitated God using the Romans to destroy it were the Jews. Are you with me or not? The Jewish nation. Notice Matthew 22 verses 7 and 8. This is a parable of Christ. The parable of the great banquet. When they rejected his son, they rejected the invitation, the party for his son. It says, but when the king, by the way, that's God the Father. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies. What were those armies? So the Romans were God's armies? That's what the parable says. And sent his armies and destroyed those murderers. Who was to blame? Why did God use his armies to destroy them? Because of what they did to whom? To the Son. And so it says he sent forth his, his armies, that's Rome, and destroyed those murderers. And what did he do? And he burned up their city. Allow me to read you a statement from Great Controversy, pages 35 and 36. See, Ellen White had this very clear. She says, the Jews had forged their own fetters. They had filled for themselves the cup of vengeance. In the utter destruction that befell them as a nation, and in all the woes that followed them in their dispersion, they were but reaping the harvest which their own hands had sown. Says the prophet, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. Did the people of the prince destroy the city? Yes, they did. Who is the prince? Jesus. Who is the people of the prince? The nation that he came to save. But they rejected him, and in that way, they brought destruction upon themselves. The people of the prince truly did destroy the city. So, 
says the prophet, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Their sufferings are often, often represented as a punishment visited upon them by the direct decree of God. It is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. By stubborn rejection of divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them, and Satan was permitted to rule them according to his will. Is that clear? By the way, in the Old Testament, do you know that, it, that the Old Testament says that God destroyed Jerusalem? You can read it in Daniel 9 verse 14. But in 2 Chronicles 36, it says Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. But in Daniel chapter 9, verses 11, 14, and 15, it says the Jews did. So who destroyed the city? Where does the process start? It starts with the people. And then God uses Nebuchadnezzar. God uses the army. Now we need to come to one final point. That is the ending point of the 70 weeks. When do the 70 weeks end? Well, the last week begins in the year what? 27. With the anointing of the Messiah, the baptism of Messiah. Three and a half years later, what happens to the Messiah? He's cut off. He causes the sacrifice and the oblation to what? Cease. To cease. And as a result, the sentence is pronounced against whom? Jesus. Against Jerusalem. Now if Jesus died in the middle of the last week, when would the 70 weeks end? They would end three and a half years later. In the fall of the year what? 34. Now you say, wait, wait a minute pastor, between 27 and 31 there's four years, between 31 and 34 there's only three. <laughs> Not if you go from the fall of 27 to the fall of 28 to the fall of 29 to the fall of 30 to the spring of 31. That's three and a half. From the spring of 31 to the spring of 32 to the spring of 33 to the spring of 34 to the fall of 34 is three and a half. Are you with me? And so this prophecy comes to an end after three and a half additional years. In other words, even after the nation rejected Christ, mercy still lingered for three and a half more years. And by the way, in the presentation that we're going to have day after tomorrow, I'm going to deal with that extra period of mercy that God gave them for three and a half years. And we're going to deal a little bit, bit, bit more closely with the stoning of Stephen as the fulfillment of the final stage of the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Notice Matthew chapter 10 verses 5 and 6 very quickly. Here we're told that the mission of Jesus was only for the Jews when he was here on earth. It says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. In other words, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did Jesus tell the disciples not to go to the Samaritans, not to go to the Gentiles? Because the 70 weeks applied especially during this period to whom? to the Jewish nation. See, Jesus is aware of this. That's why he says, the time for the Jews is not up. Don't go to the Gentiles. Go with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. This is the triumphal entry of Jesus. He arrives at the temple. He finds the money changers in the temple. It says there in verses 12 and 13, and Jesus went into the temple of God. What was the temple when Jesus went into it? The temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, what? My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. When he goes into the temple, notice, he calls it the temple of God and he says, it's my house. Only two chapters later, at the end of chapter 23, Actually, let's read chapter 21 and verse 43, first of all. Jesus says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Was the kingdom going to be taken away from the Jewish nation? And given to a nation that produces the fruits? Yes. Who was that nation that was going to produce the fruits? It was the Gentiles. 
By the way, Jesus gives a scathing rebuke of the religious leaders in Matthew tw chapter 23 and verses 32 to 38. Let's read it very quickly as we close. Jesus says, Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. That's some way to address them, isn't it? How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Now notice this. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you, really the verb is future, I will send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Even after his death, was he going to send to the Jewish nation prophets and wise men and scribes? Yes. What were they going to do with them? And some of them ye shall what? Kill. For example, Stephen. And crucify. And some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues. Did, did they do that with Peter and John? Yes. yes. And persecute them from city to city. Who did that? Saul of Tarsus. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah son of Berechias. Whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee. How often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. And now notice, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He went into the temple, he called it my house, he called it the temple of God. Now he says, your house is left unto you what? Is left unto you desolate. You remember that little word desolate? Was that word in Daniel? Yes. Last two verses of Daniel, desolate? That Jerusalem will be left desolate? Because they rejected the Messiah? Now, we need to go two verses in closing. Matthew 24, 15. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. Once again, the word desolate and the word abomination. The two words that we found at the end of Daniel chapter 9. Matthew chapter 24 and uh, verse 15. Here Jesus says to his disciples, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Were those two words at the end of Daniel 9? Yes. Oh, okay. When she shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Now go with me to Luke chapter 21. Our last text. Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. What does that mean when you see the abomination of desolation surrounding Jerusalem or, or surrounding the holy place? Notice Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. The same concept but in different words. Jesus says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, etc. What was the abomination of desolation? It was when the Roman armies according to what this says, surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And why did they overcome Jerusalem and burn it? Because they did not know the hour of their what? Visitation. Who is at the very center of the prophecy of the 70 weeks all the way through? Is it some future antichrist who's going to sit in the Jerusalem temple, take away the sacrifices, become a nasty fellow, the devil's emissary? Persecute the Jews after the church has been raptured to heaven? Is there anything about that in this passage? No. This passage is not about the Antichrist. It is about the Christ. And people need to know it. Is it a serious offense to take a passage that speaks about the Christ and to apply it to Antichrist? That's the worst type of blasphemy. Of course, the devil doesn't want people to study this as a messianic prophecy because it makes God look good. God is able to predict with precision the exact date of the events of the life of the Messiah. And let me tell you, folks, if he's able to do that, it certainly tells us that he is God and that he is in control. He knows everything which is going to happen. And if God can reveal something as complex as this centuries before it happened, and he controls human history in this way. He have no problem taking control of our lives if we give our lives to him. 
because we will not have any better off, we will not be any better off than the Jews if we reject Jesus. You know, we're not anti-Semitic. We're just reading what the Gospels have to say. You know, if we reject Jesus, we're in the same boat. So all the more incentive for us to receive Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of studying this magnificent prophecy tonight. We thank you because you revealed the mission of Jesus long before it ever took place. I ask, Lord, that you will help us each day to draw closer to Jesus, that he might come into our hearts, into our lives. We want to serve him. He's such a wonderful Messiah. He's done everything for us. We commit our lives to you and to him. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, um, tomorrow...